So these are our two speakers, and uh, you, if you saw the um, uh, the flyer, you you will have seen their bios. But I'll just very briefly uh, talk about both of them, and I I want to. Um, Thank them both for putting their time and energies to help us all learn today. We really appreciate it. And, um, and I, have, I have the pleasure of knowing both of them and they're both fantastic people. So <laughs> that's awesome as well. And, and before I go any further, I do wanna welcome everyone else who, who is on the call. Thank you for, for taking the time out of your own busy lives to, to, uh, to join this webinar. Uh, Sarah Makaroff is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Nursing in the University of Alberta, Canada. Um, she has also um, participated in the Crescent Program, which is the Kidney Research Scientist Core Education and National Training Program. So it's, it's a quite a prestigious award, and she's uh, been part of that program as both a postdoctoral fellow and as a new investigator, and I feel lucky to have her. And she is also uh, one of the researchers who has been uh, engaging patients in her work very regularly for a very long time, even before this whole uh, can solve and spore thing happened. So I would consider her um, a, a, a definitely an expert in this field. Um, and our other um, presenter is Dwight, who is the taller of the two people in that second photo there. And uh, he lives in St. John and works as a senior application analyst and was diagnosed with, I'm going to see if I can say it, chronic tubulo interstitial nephritis in 20. Got it. Got it. Yeah. yeah. And it's in remission now, but um, he lives with uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, and we are so grateful to have him and his expertise here because he's been engaging in research now for for over a year and, uh, and is uh, extremely um, engaged in the whole cancel CKD network. So those are our speakers. Um, next slide, please. So this is what we'll do. Welcome and introductions, which we've gotten rid of. So check mark right there. Um, Kara has a presentation that she's going to give, and then we'll open it up for um, a q and I think Graham will mute everyone's uh, phones while she talks, just to make sure there's no background. Um, so if you do have a, a question, maybe just hold on to it until, uh, until the end of her, her chat. Um, and then Dwight will talk about his own experience engaging uh, with research. And the same thing, there'll be a time for Q&A. And then hopefully by at the end, there'll be a little bit of time so that we can all chat and you can ask questions to whatever, um, to whoever is on the phone to each other. And, and then we'll, we'll wrap up and close and, and get you on your way within, within the hour. Uh, so uh, unless there are any questions, comments, concerns at this point. All right then. Uh, I think I, this is my cue to hand it over to Kara and uh, take us away, Kara. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining at all the different time zones across Canada for, um, yeah, the opportunity for us to speak together today. So um, this is the title of our whole webinar about and the perspectives on engaging patients through the research process and I think also throughout the research process. Um, so I'm just going to move on perhaps to the next slide about the objectives for the session that I'm going to talk about, which are to understand the research process. Um, and I'm going to, the second objective is I'm going to provide examples describing how people living with kidney disease are engaging in one example of patient oriented kidney research. And I'm going to draw upon one project that I'm involved with called EPRO Kidney. And uh, on the next slide, for those of you who are visual learners, this is just an outline. I'm gonna start with just telling you a little bit about myself um, and then unpacking the research process. So the what, why, and how, I'm drawing on one example, and then just conclude with a few uh, takeaway messages from this brief talk. So the next slide. So uh, this is a picture of my mom and dad. My mom was a nurse and um, I was born in Saskatchewan. My three siblings are here. I'm the one with the nerdy glasses and the pigtails on the side of your head. Um, and uh, I did a nursing degree at the University of Saskatchewan. And while I did that degree, I worked as a research assistant in agriculture, actually in winter wheat. And that was my first foray into research at the time. Um, 
this is a picture of me wearing my mom's nursing uniform, which I wore for Halloween one year. I did subsequently get photos taken of it because I thought it was so cool. And after I did my nursing degree, um, I worked first in pediatrics and then in mental health. And then I went on to do a master's in nursing in policy and practice. And my research was specifically with people, uh, particularly uh, nurses, who had li were living with disabilities. And um, from there, I went on and I did a PhD in nursing, um, at specifically in the area of um, end-stage kidney disease. And then I did a four-year postdoc. So all together, I was at university for 16 years um, to learn about how to engage in research. But now I'm really learning about it. Uh, I'm a, an assistant professor, and as Liz mentioned, a Cansol Crescent new investigator. So that's kind of how I came to be doing what I'm doing and the training that I had all along the way. Um, next slide. You know, when we think about what is research, it can be perceived a bit as like a black box. On the left hand side, something foreign goes in, it enters this black box, we don't really know what happens in there, and out comes research. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this process and perhaps shed some light on this black box. And the next slide, please. Just to provide a little bit of structure, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about the what, why, and how of health research. And I'm going to draw on some materials here developed by Canadian Institutes of Health Research. They have a national SPORE initiative, and that stands for Strategies for Patient-Oriented Research. And you'll see at the bottom of the slide some names of the authors, and you will see one of our own, Nicholas Fernandez. He's a patient collaborator and, and strong advocate and participant with CanSolve CKD. So that to have to give a shout out to him. So the next slide. So what is health research? It's focused on asking and answering questions that lead to healthier, to a healthier Canada and to healthier Canadians. And we can think about it as four main types of research. And I'm just going to talk really briefly about each one of them. The first one is biomedical research. So this type of research studies normal and abnormal functions of cells and molecules in the body. So basic biomedical researchers, they would do their work in laboratories. They use scientific instruments, um, test tubes and animals like mice and rats. They look at cell samples and they use microscopes, um, chemical analyses, and then they use different tools and methods to explore this type of research. So an example might be looking at some approach to a kidney transplant and failures and successes at cellular levels, um, or taking new medications that might be used in kidney disease or perhaps in transplantation for immunosuppression and looking at how do those medications work on mice and rats. Or genetic work, looking uh, specifically looking at DNA to different types of kidney disease. So those would be examples of biomedical re research. The second one, and perhaps on the next slide if you don't mind, is clinical. So clinical research involves human participants with a specific health condition. And in our examples today, we're talking about kidney disease. But so it can involve researchers asking patients questions using blood or tissue samples or checking in with a patient to see how they're progressing um, with a new course of treatment or throughout a study. So one example that we often hear about is something called clinical trials. So these would be, for example, to test medications or treatments or to compare one treatment group against another treatment group. So these types of trials have predetermined requirements about who can and cannot be enrolled in a study. So you'll see a little diagram that I ha have here about people would be randomly assigned into a treatment or a control group. They don't know which assignment that they're getting. And this is to ensure the notion of objectivity and figuring out, can we look at something called cause and effect? Does A influence B, yes or no? And so those uh, are some of the things that we'll be looking at with clinical. The next one, thank you, is health systems and services research. So this type of research looks at improving the efficacy and the effectiveness of health professionals work, 
but also the healthcare system itself. So you could look at things like policy changes or changes in practice. So health service researchers would use um, surveys, focus groups, trials, they compare data from health records or other sources of data. And just to give an example, a lot of when people ask me what type of research I do, I often say I do health services or health systems research. So I'm going to give an example now specifically to take it away from the abstract, if you don't mind, thanks. This is just one uh, study as an example of health systems and services research. So, and it's called EPRO Kidney and it's funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research as well as through my position in CanSolve uh, and Crescent CKD. So, in the next slide, if you don't mind. So, just really briefly in this study, our goal is to understand how can we best support clinicians and administrators in routinely utilizing electronic capture of patient reported outcomes and experiences to enhance person-centered care. So you hear, you'll see here that we talk about how do you best support clinicians and administrators. So that aligns really directly with this notion of health services where we're looking at the system and the people that work within the system who provide care. So we're working in this project with healthcare professionals, so nurses, dietitians, social workers, and nephrologists, as well as with people living with kidney disease. And we're working together to determine how would kidney patients best like their self-reports of their quality of life to be used in their care. So that's kind of like our goal. So next slide, if you don't mind. So this is just, this is a six foot tall banner. It is in home dialysis units in Edmonton and Calgary. And it says at the top, are you a home dialysis patient? Help us improve person-centered care. And then it goes on to say, these are the goals. What would be your role? You can participate if, and that's just inclusion exclusion criteria. So um, these large banners are on site in home dialysis, both in Northern and Southern Alberta renal program, NARP and SARP. So just a note about how these banners came apart. So um, we were doing a focus group with nurses and they told us that our like eight and a half by 11 photocopy, you know, like a piece of paper like this, which we had up on the bulletin boards, they just said, they're not cutting the mustard. People don't know, you need to create a, a bigger and better poster. And so we said, well, like what? So they recommended this. So we worked with them to create this. And then we put it through ethics, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit for it to be approved. So um, uh, on the next slide here. So this is a picture of those banners, both in Northern and Southern Alberta renal program in Edmonton and Calgary. So if you happen to be a patient on, on home dialysis in Edmonton or Calgary, if that's your center, and if you see this poster, somebody will be in the waiting room during clinic hours and you're welcome to participate because the study is, is fully underway. And these are staff that are in the clinics every single day that those home dialysis clinics are running. So um, yeah, so that's just an intro to the project. So we're just gonna take a pause on that and we're gonna go back now to those four types of research. The last one, it's referred to as social, cultural and population health research. So this type of research acknowledges that as people, we're shaped by our society, by our culture, and by our environment, and these influence our lives. So for people that have chronic kidney disease, many of them also have diabetes, for one example. We know that the rates of diabetes are impacted by many of these things. So for example, social could be um, smoking, cultural could be the diet, environment could be access or cost to vegetables and fruits. So people that are doing this type of research, for example, it might be led by community leaders where they're looking at the, the culture, the context, and considering how these things would inform, for example, how would we provide more balanced diets in this, in this space? How would we encourage exercise? How would we look at reducing smoking in this environment? So in the next slide. So each of these four types of research offer studies that complement each other. So it's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. So this is a picture clearly of Darth Vader. 
you need all of those pieces of the jigsaw puzzle to be, figure out that we're actually looking at a picture of Darth Vader here. So when we're thinking about the different types of research, whether we're looking at cells or DNA, people living with kidney disease, caregivers of those living with kidney disease, healthcare providers, the system, the healthcare system in Canada, the government that informs the system and the delivery of care. Each of these are puzzle pieces that we need for focused and thoughtful attention in health research when it comes to kidney disease. So that's kind of like the what is it? So why is the next slide? So why do we engage in health research? So overall, the purpose is to promote and to protect the health and the well-being of the people who need it most and those who are living with the illness, whatever that illness might be for our context is kidney. But it also provides hope for those that are living with an illness as well as to their families because they're in it as much as they are. It also helps us understand people's experiences and how to improve the system in which they're receiving care. So for example, in that EPRO kidney um, study that I was telling you about, we're asking people, how do you want your self-reports used in the care that is provided to you? And then on this slide, I also have some other examples. So safety in healthcare, which is a high priority to people that are in the system receiving care. Prevention. So for example, how can we prevent kidney disease in the first place? How can we prevent acute kidney injury? And then innovation of those tools and the systems so that they're sustainable for the long run. And then moving on to from the why, how. So it's not a simple process of how you do research. And this is called um, a research life cycle. And typically it starts at the top from identifying and prioritizing and moves around. But it is cyclical. And I will not kid you, it doesn't always go in a linear circular fashion. It goes back and forth and back and forth. And sometimes you get halfway through and you got to go all the way back. <laughs> so it's, it's more like a kaleidoscope is probably a better metaphor here. So I'm going to take you through each of these steps, just giving an example from, again, that one study. So on the next slide here. So for EPRO kidney, chronologically, in the summer of 2015, I started with an idea. And I started writing grants and putting together a team. Um, and you'll see Loretta Lee, who's on this um, webinar, but also uh, is a part of the slide. She was one of the first people that I started collaborating with. So Loretta is a patient collaborator and co-chair of our patient advisory committee. And um, any idea, uh, and anytime you're bringing people together, that takes time for relationships and for good work to emerge. So throughout this time, we started identifying what are our priorities, we started designing and writing, and we started pulling together this proposal. So as people started coming on board, we created a team to look at this project. And on the next slide, you'll see a list of the team. They're identified by name, but also by their logos on this slide. And they're from multi disciplines, but also industry um, from across, and government, actually. So, um, and on the next slide, you'll see we also have a patient advisory committee. So um, when I was thinking about today, I realized that, you know, it took me over four months to find people who were willing to volunteer on the patient advisory committee. And I thought, this is so great that we're having this webinar because finding and identifying people for things like such as this is a real need in the research community. So this is a photo from last May. We had a full day training with, with Alberta Strategies for Patient-Oriented Research Score through their patient engagement platform. And we talked about as a team, how are we going to engage in this, this research with this project together? And we actually have two sister projects. And so people represented here are from the two, from the two projects. So um, I guess my, what I wanted to point out here is that people are involved in this project um, on feedback throughout that research life cycle. So just going back to that cycle, if you don't mind, the next slide. So the next step here is um, looking at submitting preparation and grant proposal. So one of the things that people may not know is that in order to do research 
as researchers, we need to get the money. So we have to basically fundraise to do the money. And so we write proposals and we submit them to bodies who give money for research. And it's a competition for that research. So we write our grants to get the money. These grants are reviewed nationally by our peers, by other researchers, but also patients may be involved in that research process. So they read the applications, they provide feedback, they deliberate, and the process is very rigorous and it takes time. So we started to go through that submission and to our shock and surprise, we were funded one year later. So the reason for the shock is that um, at this time, Canadian Institutes of Health Research had a 9% success rate. So that means 91% of people are not funded. So it's really competitive. When we got the money, after we got over our shock, we realized, okay, we got to do something now. So it took me and our team one year to get ready to do the research. So we started by hiring and training, writing the protocols for the multiple sites. We started by writing multiple ethics applications. So we write applications, ethics applications to all universities involved and all health authorities. And then for renal, there are also renal subgroups that may need ethical um, application and approval. So it's a very detailed application to ensure that all steps of the research process treat patients or participants, because it, obviously in our projects it's also healthcare practitioners, that they're treated respectfully, that all of their rights are protected throughout the project. So a good example that most people are familiar with is something called informed consent. These consent forms go through an ethics application, but they're just one of many, many things that go through. For example, confidentiality with a transcriptionist, or um, scripts for focus groups and interviews, or signs like that banner, that all goes through ethics. Um, what data are you collecting? Where are you storing that data? Who will have access to the data? What are you going to do with that data? Those types of things. So that's all involved in the ethics process. Then um, in that year also, we were meeting with the different sites, the managers, with the administrators to ensure that it aligned with their process because this happens in real time in clinic flow. And we consulted with the patient advisory team and the research team throughout. So that's what we were doing to like get ready to actually do the research. And then on the next slide, so data collection. So from the top of the cycle to that green arrow, it took me and our team two years to get there. So now it's going to take us another two years to, to collect the data. So uh, we started in fall 2017 and we, every person that comes into home dialysis that volunteers with our study, we meet them one-on-one -on -one every single time that they come to the clinic for two years. So we're halfway through this process. So on the next slide, if you don't mind, it just breaks down for you a little bit more detail in northern and southern Alberta renal pro programs. So we started on different dates. In the northern um, program, patients complete one quality of life survey prior to their clinic, and then it's given to their nurse first. Then they complete three more surveys about their quality of life and the health care that they've received after their clinic. So these surveys are considered research data. Um, we follow them for two years, but we've also had focus groups and interviews both with patients and with healthcare professionals about how um, they think this data can and should be used. And we're, we're asking for their feedback to develop workshops that will be provided to the clinicians. In Southern, we started a little bit later, it's the same process, except for that information is not provided to clinicians in real time. And then the workshops will be provided at the end of the study. So on the next slide, you'll see we have, uh, from a couple weeks ago, my latest count was 388 home dialysis patients in Alberta who are currently volunteering. So if you look across the province, that's about 64% of home dialysis patients in um, that are participating in this study. So though they are acting as research participants, but also we have patients, including Loretta and others, 
who are a part of the research advisory process. So they're giving feedback throughout. And together, both the patient participants and the patients as advisors are giving feedback on how we design these workshops or education sessions for practitioners. So the next slide, if you don't mind. Okay, so those are the green slides we've gone, the green arrows we've gone through so far. The blue arrows are yet to happen. So this analysis and interpretation of data happens when you've got all of your data, it's done, you've finished collecting it, and your team comes together and you start looking at the data from the numbers as well as the words. So those are focus groups and interviews. And you bring together scholars to process what have we learned? What can we recommend? What can we take away from this? And then it moves into something called dissemination, which is like sharing your findings with people. So like this webinar would be a really good example of starting to share findings or presenting at patient conferences or going to scholarly conferences or writing up articles in peer reviewed publications or writing up articles in patient newsletters or brochures. That type of dissemination takes a few years as well. Then the next phase is about the implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. So this is the ongoing feedback loop into the sites where they're providing that care. But it drives, from my perspective, it drives into the next research processes, projects that you discover are gaps. And it's like, oh, we didn't look at this, but we see a need for this. So the uptake in healthcare of innovations and recommendations takes time for that integration and scrutiny of how that should actually unfold. But I guess why, for me, why that's important is because healthcare that's informed by evidence and research will provide the best care and the best treatment, especially when it's in partnership with the people that are living with it, living with the disease. So just to wrap up this research 101 part of the webinar, just some takeaway messages on the next slide. So kidney research happens in many different ways. And those are the four ways that I was talking about. And they happen for a good reason. They all have different foci. Research takes time. That research life cycle does not happen quickly. And it's for a good reason. Those checks and balances are to ensure that the research is done well. And the last part is just that it's imperative that the people that are living with kidney disease collaborate with the different types of research as well as throughout that research process. And it's for a good reason. So the last slide here is I just have my email address. Um, you're welcome to contact me, but also we will have time um, for question and answer in this webinar. So I'm just going to pause and pass it over, the mic over to others at this point. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, does anyone on the line have any uh, specific questions for Kara about what she's just uh, just told us? We have about five minutes before, uh, before we need to get on to Dwight. But if anyone has a question, um, please, please raise your hand or Graham, uh, you can explain how people ask. So now I'm not sure if, if people haven't been able to unmute their phones or, <laughs> or, or if there are no questions yet. So I'm, I'm going to give another little beat. And um, I think there, if you put your, your mouse near the bottom of the screen, um, there's a little chat button and you can, you can write in that if you can't uh, unmute your phone. Or perhaps Kara was just enormously clear and, and there are no questions. So, and that's fine as well. You can leave it at that. I, I, uh, Kara, can I, I ask you just, um, oh. go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, Kara, can any patient, new patient join in any part of the research project? since you're following them again for quite a period of time. Is that a, a possibility? Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. And great job. Thanks. 
sorry, was your question with regards to like in general any research project or were you talking about the one that I was talking about, EPRO kidney? Both actually, both, both questions. Okay. So the answer is yes and no. So for any type of research project, um, you, want, you have something called in criteria, criteria for involvement, inclusion and exclusion criteria. So for example, if I was doing a study and I was looking at specifically children um, who needed transplantation, I might be looking at children who are certain ages. So you'd have to meet that inclusion criteria of that age. Um, for people that um, perhaps are involved in consenting to allow their blood to be used in a certain project, they would be looking for people with specific, for example, family history. So not anybody can participate, right? You have to meet the inclusion criteria. So that's the first thing. For a pro kidney, anybody that's in living in Alberta and you go to your clinic appointments either in Edmonton or in Calgary, if you are willing to volunteer, uh, you understand what we're you have the cognitive ability to understand what the consent process means. If you can read and speak English, then you can participate. So every study is gonna have that type of inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, one of the things that I have encountered in, in many projects in the past is when people have wanted to participate and they actually don't meet the inclusion criteria. And that happens, you know, and uh, often I'll have conversations with people saying, Thank you so much for volunteering, but it, uh, your circumstances don't meet this study, but there may be other studies. And so I guess for the people, those of us who are on the other side, what we always want to do is say, thank you so much for being willing to volunteer and to ask. And if it doesn't meet on this one, there'll be another one. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, cause that way we can, we're able to respond and I know it's never an easy answer. So it's almost like, come back to that researcher. Great job though, Kara. Wow. Thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, any, any other questions before we pass the, the baton on to Dwayne? Uh, I have a question. Um, Kara, are, are all of your, uh, surveys and patients, um, questionnaires only available during the training for home therapies or are patients able to do them at home if they um, want to participate but are in extremely rural um, spots? Great question. So in this project that I was talking about, EPRO Kidney, uh, it stands for electronic patient reported outcomes and so I didn't get into all of the details about this. Um, when people are on the home modalities, they come to their clinics usually once every three or every six months. Um, so physically when they come in this process, this research, what we're doing is the recruitment is face to face the first time, but then over the two years, it's not face to face because everything that we've created is actually electronic. So it is all on the web for those that are willing because not everybody wants to, they can use their phone, their tablet, their computer. And the principle behind it is that people who provide this data own their data. It is theirs. They choose to share it with researchers and they choose to share it with practitioners. For people that don't want to use a computer, a phone, a tablet, etc., we mail it to them. So in this project, we actually have the full gamut of um, ways to collect data. And my personal perspective is that I think as more and more of this moves electronic, it's going to support those who are in rural, rural environments so that we don't have to do everything face to face, for example, like telehealth. But that also requires good internet <laughs> connections and not everybody wants to do stuff on the computer. Like some people don't want to touch that stuff, you know, so there has to be options for people because um, it might not be a support. Does that answer your question? Uh, hi, Kara. I'm from St. John's. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, the only question I have really, Kara, is uh, your research is, seems like a very good, uh, very good stuff, but are you sharing some information about this finding 
or anything available to be useful to everybody else? Yeah, great question. Great question. <clears throat> so, um, so um, oh, sorry, I'm getting oh, sorry. feedback. Um, it um, could, it, so for all research, there is a process where you collect data and then you begin to share your results. And in this project that I'm talking about, um, we still are collecting information for pa from patients and from healthcare providers for another year. So anything that I'd be sharing right now, like what I'm even telling you right now, it's preliminary because I couldn't say absolutely this is what we know, you know. But what I can say is I've done multiple projects before this and what those previous projects was this and this and this. And so, um, for example, in this EPRO kidney, I did a pilot study for um, on Vancouver Island, actually, in home dialysis. And what we learned from that study informed how we created this study. And I'm actually, even now, I was meeting with somebody today to plan what our next project is. So we're always, you know, you're not even done and you're starting the next one because you begin to learn. But yes, absolutely, the, the, the taking the results forward is the most important part. Um, yeah, and thank awesome. you for your, your um, questions, uh, but I'm going to have to put them, um, bring them to an end because we have a presenter and we want to make sure that Dwight has enough time to get to his presentation as well. Uh, so I'm going to um, ask Graham if you don't mind to put Dwight or um, get the presentation up and, and Dwight, um, we will ask you to take it away. Perfect. Oh, that's not the right slides. <laughs> um, Liz, is that the one that I sent you, the last one? I, I did send uh, the new set to Graham. I'm hoping he... <laughs> no worries. How did you get, um, if he can't, are you able to work we'll with... We'll just roll with it, sure. No problem at all. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Kara for setting the bar pretty high. <laughs> Great job. Um, well, we're, I'm just going to go over uh, what I'm going to be discussing tonight. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you my experiences uh, with patient research and with CanSolve CKD network. Hopefully it will give parents, uh, patients here not involved in research an idea of what patient roles can be. I'm going to start off with a little background about myself and follow that with a couple of slides about CanSolve CKD network itself. Uh, next, I'll talk about the research projects that I'm involved with and mention the roles that patients can play in research and use my own experience uh, as examples. I will conclude with uh, what lessons, what gotchas I have learned as a patient partner the past year and a half or so. Next slide, please. So, uh, I currently live in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. I have been married uh, for 20 years with uh, no kids. I am currently employed as a uh, applications analyst with the NL Center for Health Information. Um, I was diagnosed with uh, systemic vasculitis and chronic kidney disease. Uh, vasculitis is an uncommon disease uh, it's uh, inflammation of your blood cells. So it causes changes in blood vessel walls, including thickening and weakening, scarring. These changes can restrict blood flow, uh, resulting in organ and tissue damage. Uh, vasculitis usually attacks the kidneys, but ironically in my case, it went after uh, my eyes and my lungs. So if you see this left eye drift, don't be surprised. <laughs> Uh, I'm blind in that eye. Um, my kidney damage actually resulted from a drug interaction during the treatment for my vasculitis. Um, my kidney function uh, has remained stable over the past several years at about uh, 45%. Um, in 19, in uh, 2017, I became a patient partner 
with can solve CKD network, but more on that later. So what is um, can solve CKD network and what did I have to do? That's the one. Perfect. Oh. Um, what do they have to do with patient research? And as you can see here, if you are asking the question, what can solve CKD network is, the picture on the left um, yeah, explains it all. Uh, amazing people, both uh, patient and researchers, health providers, uh, policymakers, Care give givers is a is a candle wide network that brings all of us together. Um, it's one of the five networks established through the national strategy for patient or or oriented research to focus on chronic kidney disease. The network is called CanSolv CKD Network. It stands for Canadians Seeking Solutions and Innovations to Overcome. CKD. Our network brings together more than 150 partners from all across Canada. The network's strength lies in diverse perspectives. Patients working alongside researchers, healthcare uh, professionals, and policy makers. Next slide, please. From the SPORE framework, the term patients is our overarching term inclusive, inclusive of in individuals with personal experience of a health issue and informal care givers, including family and friends. Patients are at the heart of everything we do. We call them patient partners in our, net, in our network as it was a term decided by the patient council early on. Our patients would be treated as equal partners in patient-oriented research. It is a term that resonates with the group. The picture on the left, these are our awesome founding co-chairs of our patient council, Kathy, Mike, Kathy, Kate, and, and Mike. They are indigenous and non-indigenous they share different lived experience of kidney disease and bring various talents to our network. Next slide, please. Research themes. We have research projects across three main themes that include identifying kidney disease earlier and support those who are at the highest risk of negative outcomes. Uh, the second research theme is defining the best treatments to improve outcomes and qualities of life. Uh, an example of this would be improving symptoms for those on dialysis and delaying progression with new treatments. Uh, last but not least, innovative care. So defining optimal ways to deliver patient centered care in the 21st century. So an example of that would be improving living donor rates and experience. Next slide, please. So how did I get involved with CanSolve? Well, by accident, really. One day in 2017 while searching, while surfing on the Kidney Foundation webpage, looking for low salt recipes, I saw a link to the CanSolve webpage. I clicked on that link and started reading. Reading about the network and what the research that they were doing really interested me. The patient stories really touched and inspired me. I was hooked, so I signed up right away. The very next month, I was in Montreal for the annual meeting. And I gotta say, when I got up there, I was a little intim intimidated at first. Uh, I'm a shy and introverted person by, by nature, 
So I knew I'd be pretty uncomfortable at, at times. And also I had no knowledge or training in the research process. Uh, lots of medical terms were being thrown around at times. So it was pretty, pretty slow going and confusing. But regardless, I wanted to be involved. I wanted to make a difference and improve the lives with C uh, improve the lives of people living with CKD, including myself, of course. And I also wanted the opportunity to meet other patients with CKD. Uh, in Montreal, I never forget this. Uh, the first night we had a uh, sharing circle, and there I heard other patients talking about their experience with kidney disease. And for the first time in a long time, I did not feel alone. I felt a very strong connection to these people. Uh, and so from that, there was, no, there was no going back. In fact, I became a member of the uh, patient council. I, I volunteered to be a member of their curriculum membership committee and signed up to be a patient partner on four research projects. And this is the part that I wanted to focus on. When I first joined Kent, oh, can I go to the next slide, please? Uh, so when I first joined CANSOLV, I was asked what projects were of interest to me. I looked for projects and tried to find ones where my stage of CKD would be useful to the research team. And I decided on the cell therapy trial. And this is a pilot test using bone marrow derived cells to prevent the loss of kidney function and the self-management study. And these are strategies to enhance patient uh, management of CKD. Uh, later, I would be in, uh, assigned two more projects due to a lack of uh, patient partners. And they are the, uh, the Canadian Glomerulonephritis uh, Registry Patient Advisory Committee. Um, it's a network developed, uh, a network to develop personalized treatments for patients with GN and uh, identify ways of detecting high risk GN. And the kidney risk equation. This is a study built around an equation that accurately predicts the risk of kidney failure in patients with kidney disease. This equation uses routine lab tests and can help patients and doctors understand their risk better. This information reduces anxiety and empowers patients to better control their disease and its risk factors. I'm actually the uh, patient lead on this project. Um, and that means that I act as a go-between between, between um, the research team and the patient partners. But at no time when I was signing up uh, for, for this work did I feel pressure, um, I, that I feel pressure to do more than what I could effectively manage and not impact uh, my home uh, work balance. Uh, next slide, please. So that's great, but what do I actually uh, do on these projects? Before I get to that, uh, I, uh, I did um, a course. I pulled this slide from a patient in research course that I did last fall. I just wanted to uh, put this up and just show that uh, that slide that Kara had up of all the uh, phases of um, the research process, patients can perform roles in all phases. You can see there from advising on priorities and grant applications to co-designing studies, collect interpret data, help write reports, present at conferences. These are just a few of uh, the roles that patients can do. Next slide, please. 
So what have I done um, on these projects? Well, in essence, I try and do whatever I can. Uh, that being said, I started with CanSolve after all these projects were well underway. So this does affect some of the roles in which you can play. I found that um, my main role that I've done on all four projects has been, I provided like feedback on uh, the research protocols and on project websites. Uh, reviewed patient consensus seems to be like the bulk of the work. Uh, on the self-management project, I've participated in the research itself. I was given uh, a phone interview. And I talked about how uh, my family and I managed, uh, successfully managed my, my disease. Um, I also tried, um, I've also was recruiting uh, patients for this self-management study. I did that online and at, at the uh, clinic. Last spring, we developed Nash, um, fish, fictional personas of people uh, with C CKD based on uh, the information gathered from uh, the interviews. Uh, and then last June, we got together for a day and a half. Using these personas, we identified the key uh, content for uh, eHealth uh, CKD self-management tool. And in the next few months, I will be part of the screening slash data abstraction from internet sites for relevant information about self-management techniques. Uh, much of the work I have done and the project meetings I have attended have been over the phone or email. I, I would be sunk without technology. All the projects that I am involved with are in central or western Canada. Uh, there, there are opportunities to meet the project team, but usually that is uh, once a year at the CanSolve meeting. Uh, I found that sometimes it can be challenging though to find roles for patients. Maybe it's the nature of the research project itself. Uh, or it might be the particular phase that the project is in. Uh, for example, um, the um, kidney risk equation, uh, it's spent uh, this phase, we are recruiting clinics in Manitoba and Alberta. Uh, so there's not a lot of stuff for patients to do currently at, at the moment. And also um, it may be that um, a particular uh, research team is better at finding roles for patients, but I'm not sure what it is, but it has been uneven at times. Uh, next slide, please. So what lessons have I learned in the past year or, or so? Being a patient partner is a very rewarding and enjoyable experience. You're constantly learning new things, meeting a lot of amazing people, and there is some, some travel. But the main thing is that you're helping change the way that kidney research is done. But it, as Kara mentioned, it, it can be frustrating at times. It's, it's slow going. Uh, moving through the research process can be painfully slow. There are rules that must be followed. Approvals, from ethic boards, Health Canada can sometimes be a bureaucratic nightmare. For example, the cell therapy uh, trial that I'm helping with has been sidelined by Health Canada. They wanted at least another year of animal trials before go going with human trials. We just got the report in July and the report is not what they are hoping for. So the study itself will, will shift from stem cells to a promising drug 
that might slow the progression of CKD. Now, with me, I'm fine with that, just because as long as we're going to help people in, in the end, that's, that's what it's all about. Uh, second lesson I found is uh, take advantage of training if offered. Sometimes you actually got to go out and seek out the, the uh, training. Uh, I was able to sign up for an online course with, with St. Michael last year. I'm getting some feedback there now. Um, and the more knowledge is power, and the more you know about research, the research process, uh, the more you can contribute to its success. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to think outside the box uh, for finding a role for, for your, yourself. Uh, my pace of employment manages the provincial health record, uh, the provincial electronic health record. And I've noticed, I noticed that the inputs to the uh, kidney risk equation uh, were in the electronic health record. And I said, well, that's perfect. We got the inputs, all we need is the equation. So I approached uh, the business owner of the app and I said, well, um, I explained to him what the, the kidney research equation was. And I said, it would be, it would be something, especially in the rural parts of, of, of the province that could benefit patients. So we'll see where that goes. At least the, the process has started. Um, and finally, don't be afraid to step outside your comfort zone. Uh, I found that um, even like me, like a, a year and a half ago when I joined, I, I, I didn't think that a year and a half later I would be like speaking to a group of people about my experience. I'm nervous at times, as you can tell. But it's it's a, it's a skill that that's learned, and hopefully one day I'll reach the, the level that Carol is. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like I said, uh, don't be afraid to step outside your comfort zone. You'll thank yourself later. Thank you.